Hello everyone and welcome to EART27201 Sedimentary Rocks and Fossils and the first of several videos in which I'm going to be introducing microfossils. So we've got a lot to get through. Well, I suppose, yeah, no, I think a lot to get through, but lots of really cool stuff to get through. So I am going to be providing a um, introduction to microfossils over the course of this coming video. After that, I've split microfossils up into different kind of chunks of video based on what they make their hard parts from. The first group that we're going to meet is those that make their hard parts from silica. Then we're going to meet phosphatic microfossils. Then we're going to meet some important groups of microfossils that use calcium carbonate in their hard parts before finishing with um, those microfossils that make their hard parts out of organic, organic compounds. And I'll be defining all of these <clears throat> sorry, as I go through the videos for you. However, it's always best to start by defining terms, and I've put a definition of a microfossil on the slide for you. That is any fossil that is best studied by means of a microscope. Material may include dissociated fragments of larger organisms, whole organisms of microscopic size, or embryonic forms of larger fossil organisms. Various groups are studied and used as stratigraphic markers. So essentially what we're saying here is that microfossils aren't defined in any biologically useful way. You can see lots of examples on this um, series of images here, including a lovely little uh, um, microfossil based <coughs> Christmas message from the year 1912, courtesy of the Natural History Museum in London. And if you look at these, you can see that there are a wide variety of different forms and shapes of these um, things. You can see um, also that there are microscope slides. They're very, very small. And so we're not looking at a biologically realistic grouping. This is a, a grouping that's based purely on side. So we may be looking at remains of bacteria, protists, that's a word I'm going to use a lot. And what it means is a single celled member of the group, the eukaryotes, which includes animals, um, fungi, 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 and, um, and plants and lots of these single cell groups. Um, and microfossils may themselves represent the fungi, the animals and the plants. So there are lots and lots of different biological um, categories that are placed into this kind of catch-all basket of microfossils, which I suppose is there as a definition because it reflects how they're studied and how, how they're used. They have many things in common, which makes sense to, to consider them in a single form of fossil, even though biologically that doesn't always make sense. So essentially what I'm saying is this is a taxonomically diverse and heterogeneous group of organisms, and it includes unicellular and multicellular organisms. So do bear that in mind as I go through the rest of the videos today. Microfossils are really useful for a range of different reasons and they um, represent organisms that live a wide range of different modes of life, as you can see summarized on this diagram here from um, the fantastic uh, text, which I will link you to at the end of this um, series of videos by Armstrong and Brazer from 2013 called Microfossils. So some of the organisms that go on to be microfossils are planktonic, Often they'll live in the top 200 meters or so of the water column, and that makes them useful in monitoring sea surface temperature. Examples of um, microfossils that could be used in that way include foraminifera, diatoms, radiolaria, and coccoliths. Many of those we'll be meeting over the course of these coming videos. However, other microfossils are benthic, so they live on the ocean floor. Um, that includes members of the foraminifera, the bryozoa, ostracods, and diatoms. Don't worry about that now. Again, all groups will be meeting as we go along. Some of them are even airborne. So spores and pollen we'll meet in the last video, which are derived from land plants, are airborne and they're strongly climate de dependent and can travel very long distances. So are found very, very widely. So all of this goes to show that the, the breadth of microfossils in terms of the different organisms we find and how they make, them, make their energy, where they live, and where they may, may be found. And that's basically all I wanted to get at with this slide, is that microfossils are in environments basically the world over at every time period since the, um, since the Cambrian. 
Also, I wanted to highlight that um, some of these are really um, quite uh, intensive in terms of the preparation that are required. Um, and so when it comes to the chemical extraction of microfossils, I would like you to remember that safety comes first. I think this is actually really important. Some of the acids that we uh, have to use to prepare some microfossils, especially the organic walled ones, are really, really nice, nasty. And so if you're ever working in an environment where you have to use these chemicals, be sure you know all safety precautions and all of the risks involved. The, the reason I have an image from the Aliens movie here is because the, uh, the xenomorph, shown on the left hand side here, has acid for blood, which is really kind of kind of hardcore. Um, and from the base, on the basis of the, uh, the movie where it eats through several um, layers of the uh, spaceship in the film, I suggest it's a fairly nasty acid as well. So do be aware of that. And I'm going to be introducing, along with each of the microfossils groups as I go through this, the means by which they are extracted. In terms of how we study microfossils, um, we can study them rarely with the naked eye because they're normally not that big. And that means that we have to use um, a range of different approaches. The two most common ones are with optical microscopy. So that's just using a light-based microscope, so using lenses and strong light to magnify the objects. But for our very smallest of uh, microfossils, that won't do. And so we have to use an SEM. So an SEM is a scanning electron microscope, and in its most um, basic form, what we have here is an electron gun, we have a load of um, lenses, so these are actually electromagnetic things that focus an electron beam that ultimately you, um, you blast at a sample that's held on a vacuum and then you use a detector to detect those electrons and build an image of what you're looking at. If you want some more details, there are lots of introductory texts on scanning electron microscopes that can explain that very clearly for you. And those are really, um, this is a really useful tool for looking at some of the smallest microfossils. So you can see here the scale bar is 50 microns, so that's 50 thousandths of a millimeter, or about a twentieth of a millimeter for what that's worth. So when you're looking at your smallest microfossils, you really do need um, some additional tools to be able to see them in detail. Microfossils are included in this course because they're actually really, really useful for a wide range of different applications. In part, that's because they are ubiquitous. So the distribution of microfossils is widespread and they can be amazingly abundant. This, for example, is a close-up of some chalk. And chalk is a rock that's actually made up almost 100% from a single type of microfossil um, called a coccolithophore. We're going to be meeting those later in this series of videos, but this just shows how abundant they can be. Um, this rock covers much of the southeast of, um, of England. Generally, microfossils are widespread geographically, um, and they're also widespread environmentally. They're found in shallow marine um, environments, but also at great depths, so in abyssal depths, they're found in land-based environments as well, including both fluvial and lacustrine environments. So wherever it is, um, you tend to find um, microfossils there. And they're found in a wide range of the lithologies. They're fairly facies independent. That includes sandstones, siltstones, shales, and carbonates. And microfossils are really useful um, in rocks from the Phanerozoic, so all of the way from the Cambrian through to today though the groups that are important shifts as time moves on. And they're widespread um, in terms of climate. They are, f are found from the equator all the way through to the Arctic. So microfossils, as I've mentioned, are abundant and they're easily accessible as fossils. Large numbers can be found in just small sediment samples and this makes them very useful for any situation in which we're studying, for example, rocks using boreholes. So boreholes don't give you much sediment. Um, but in that small amount of sediment, you will still have a lot of microfossils. And this means that often there are large enough quantities of fossils to allow a rigorous quantitative analysis. This can open doors um, to help us understand a wide range of rocks. This image on the left, which I must admit I just included because I like it, um, represents opening doors to understand um, rocks. This means that microfossils are widely used in a range of geological research. 
They are used in paleoclimatology, in biostratigraphy, and that I'll talk about a bit more in the next slide, but that means that they're really useful for structural and historical geology. And they're used in a wide range of other subdisciplines, including paleontology. Some of us look at these fossils um, to understand evolution in deep time. To provide a couple of more concrete examples, um, fossils are key to paleoenvironmental analysis, for example. This is the interpretation of the deep depositional environment in which a rock unit was formed as deduced from the microfossils contained in it. So we use this quite heavily in um, periods such as the Carboniferous, shown on the right hand side here, where there are lots and lots of remnants of these gorgeous lush forests in Carboniferous rocks that can help us understand their stratigraphy, um, their relationships to each other in space and time, and help us understand the fossils that we find in those more generally. As an extension, they are used in Carboniferous paleoclimatology and uh, paleobiogeography quite heavily. So that's that's really useful. Uh, I should also mention though that fossils are, sorry, microfossils are used heavily in mineral and energy resource discovery. So by that I mean in oil mining and engineering, as well as other environmental industries. So really the study of microfossils is really interesting in and of its own right, but microfossils themselves have a wide range of different applications in the real world. So I mentioned this in passing in the last slide, but I wanted to dig down just quickly into biostratigraphy. You may remember that this is just the differentiation of rock units based upon the fossils they contain. And when we were learning about biostratigraphy, you may remember we went over the things that create a good index fossil. And many of those attributes apply to microfossils. So for example, these fossils are widespread and abundant. They're often easy to recognize and they have a high preservation potential so we can find quite a lot of them. This all means that they're really useful for dating rocks, even from small samples. Given that today we have this nice geological column that's been based, built up over the last 150 years using the tools of biostratigraphy, now when we want to understand a any given unit, rock that we've not studied before, as long as it has um, fossils in it, this the, the, um, the fossils, the microfossils in particular, can play a crucial role in understanding the geological age and the geological history of that rock and the area it's found in. Um, and this can be used in real time as well. If you're for any reason trying to drill a horizontal um, borehole, um, basically you want to just stick to a particular horizon with a particular set of microfossils in it. And you can do that analysis as you're drilling to make sure you're staying in the right geological horizon, as long as that geological horizon is horizontal, of course. So for that reason, these um, fossils are very useful. And I wanted to just finish by highlighting one more reason that, that these are useful, because they're commonly used as thermal alteration or maturation indicators in rocks. So what I mean by that is that there are a range of different systems, different groups of microfossils that are used to try and figure out to what temperature a rock has been he heated, the highest temperature that rock has been heated in its geological history. So um, this normally works through um, changes in color in the fossils. So our microfossils will demonstrate thermal alteration through the changes in color. This heating could be um, due to increased depth of burial, or it could be down to contact metamorphism. When uh, a, a microfossil such as this organic matter gets heated, it undergoes a series of irreversible physical and chemical changes. These normally involve the loss of hydrogen and oxygen and then the concomitant increase in the amount of carbon in them. As you lose H and O, you tend to get more C because that's all that's left. As a result, these fossils darken as you heat them up and the color of microfossils can be used to determine the maximum temperature to which any given rock was buried. Examples of systems that people use include the cone adult alteration index as represented on the left hand side here. You can see that they go from this nice cream color to basically black as they've been heated from 50 to about 480 degrees Celsius there. Then they go to this like um, lighter gray color um, at the highest temperatures. And we'll be meeting conodonts 
in one of our subsequent videos. And there are other colour indexes based around spores and based around foraminifera. Both groups of um, microfossils we're going to be meeting in our videos. These are fairly broadly useful for any research or geological area where you want to know how much a rock has been heated and they're particularly highly prized by the oil industry as shown in the middle um, diagram here because the colour changes are indicators of the temperatures required to initiate petroleum generation. So a lot of these systems were developed by the oil industry. And with that, that brings me to the end of my introductory video. I hope this has been interesting and I'll see you in our, our next video where we're going to meet our first group of microfossils. I'll see you there.